podcast is proudly sponsored by Lois Litchford. Lois has struggled with dyslexia her entire life and her son Nicholas also has it. Using her dyslexia as a strength, she is now a literacy spokesperson for struggling learners who have fallen behind in the traditional classroom. Through coaching and workshops at international conferences, TV appearances and highly rated radio stations, she uses her own story in Reversed, a memoir, to teach educators and parents how to create flexible learning environments using comprehensive and innovating teaching methods. You can find out more about Lois and Nicholas's story through the Dear Dyslexic podcast series, episode 32. Do you have dyslexia and struggle with intimate relationships? Or are you a partner to someone who has dyslexia? Then this podcast is for you. Relationships can be hard, there's no denying it, yet they can bring so much joy to our lives. Those of us who have dyslexia, we can sometimes struggle when we're in an intimate relationship to express ourselves, our needs and our wants. And that's where Jane Kirsten comes in. Jane is a therapist who has worked with individuals, couples and families who live with learning disabilities and difficulties. Jane has children who are dyslexic and was married to a dyslexic as well. Jane began her journey in professional counselling in 1994. Jane is also the co-author of a book with Lynn Bursford on adult dyslexia. I hope you enjoy this thought-provoking interview with Jane. Thank you so much for coming on the show today, Jane. It's great to see you again. Hi, thanks for having me. It's exciting. Really good. And so for those of you that are listening today, Jane was uh, on a recent, our recent Mental Health and Thriving series and we were talking about um, some of the challenges that dyslexic people can have in intimate relationships. And so this pod to that ca- podcast today is an extension of our conversation that we had. So Jane, for our listeners, could you just introduce yourself and give a little bit of a background for those who missed out on the live video? Yes, absolutely. And I guess from my accent, you know that I'm a Kiwi from New Zealand. So uh, I've been working in private counselling and psychotherapy practice here for 20 plus years, um, maybe going into my 22nd year next year. And I specialise in adults with dyslexia and other learning difficulties uh, and giftedness. And of course, twice exceptional people, 2E, they're called, which is gifted and with a learning difference. Um, I do a lot of workshops here. I speak nationally at conferences and run workshops on a method I created for better communication for couples and families or friends with uh, dyslexia. Um, I used to work with children, but now I'm focusing more on adults and families, mainly because there's just so little out there for them. And uh, like most human services practitioners, I uh, ended up studying what I suffered myself. I grew up in a family with a step family uh, with autism and dyslexia in the mix, and it wasn't really understood back then. We've only um, really had this condition approved as a condition in New Zealand since 2007. Um, My aunt was dyslexic too, and she's now passed away, and really the family struggled. And uh, I watched the struggle and the lack of understanding, and our parents caused, you know, without knowing it, just so much hurt, Um, and especially through the school process. Thinking dyslexia wasn't really a thing, you know, it wasn't identified, and it, it was, it, it's still gone on to have a, a lot of ramifications uh, in the family today, and of course, the children now are sort of adults, and um, there's a mixture of autism and dys- dyslexia still, so generally, we're getting it better known around um, New Zealand, around what these these issues are. I was married to a dyslexic man for 21 years, and I'm not now. And that was challenging because I could see the struggle, although I didn't understand it for some time. And in the end, unfortunately, things didn't work out for us. There's a lot of trauma in the mix. And our two sons are, well, our eldest is very gifted and slightly dyslexic. The other is gifted and very auditorily dyslexic. And um, he really struggled through school with a lot of anxiety and depression. But by the time uh, when he was two, I I knew he was dyslexic, I could tell. So he's had a lot of interventions um, and help. But family life was chaotic and communication breakdowns were really difficult. And I'm a very words person and um, and my husband wasn't. So lots of difficulty. And being a curious mind, I wanted to understand why. 
So when I went and studied my master's, I knew I wanted to study dyslexia and I wanted to know what was trauma, what was childhood history, what was dyslexia. And uh, so I studied dyslexia and intimate relationships and that was a really fascinating piece of work. There's a published article out now about it. Um, we've also co-authored with another author an a, a book, which is hopefully going into an ebook on Amazon shortly. And I'm writing another now on my research and my clinical experience. So that's really the background to what I do and who I am. Thank you. It's such a great <laughs> summary and really fascinating um, to hear that it's been generational for you and what's driven you to work in this space. When you said there were lots of challenges in your family, like your bigger family, but then your immediate family, what were some of those difficulties that, um, that was part of your family dynamic? I have to say the main problem was an awareness and understanding. And in my research, it came out tops as a need for help and you know, what helps and um, really knowing what dyslexia is you know, we, they didn't know that and, and what autism is. There was some sort of understanding. My father was actually a high school teacher, but back then they didn't know about it. So, you know, the hurt that came off that with the expectations to perform academically was profound for some of the members of the family. Um, and then, it, it not you know, that whole history of childhood not being understood and pressure and not being supported, um, leading to anxiety and and depression and things like that so uh it's been a real you know I kind of feel uh, around everything that I'm doing I'm kind of super excited really about the impact of that into the family and I'm very thankful to my late father and his wife who's still alive for funding that master's research you know they did end up quite open to it and learning about it so you know lots of different hurts but mainly that one that was very kind of your late father and your, uh, his wife to help fund. It's amazing what um, our families do for us when we've got a passion. Yeah, My family has been extremely supportive of, of the foundation and the work that I'm doing. I think particularly because we've got my dad and my brother and my nephew are all uh, dyslexic. Mm, yeah, so much needs. It. And that support needs to happen right across the lifespan. So the researchers are finding and um, you know not just as with children in school. Mm. So why do you think that that's been that the focus has just been in, in school and intervention and it's only what in the last would you say 20 or 10 years that there's been more work around supporting adults? Yeah I, I just think that it predominated in the field because of neuroscience researchers who were mainly looking at reading and writing and, and things like that. And we now know that actually dyslexia affects so much more than that. So I guess because it's seen as a language educational issue, um, there's been so many myths around it <laughs> that uh, that's been where the focus has been. And, and in many ways, you know, good, because we really do need the right interventions and help like structured literacy, et cetera, uh, and the science of reading, you know, to, to help the children. If, if we can get more help when they're children and then they suffer less shame, then less shame as an adult. So, you know, not against it, but we do need to listen to our adults who haven't been identified or haven't had the, the right support, which is, you know, that's the gap. That's what we're, we're needing to research and look at and help. So what do you, what are some of the common themes that you see coming through your clinic when you've got a dyslexic person and a non-dyslexic person in a relationship? Well, I, what's really been great, and I, I did a robust piece of research for my master's, is that, that uh, the clinical experience or the people that are coming through are saying exactly the same thing, and they're struggling with exactly the same thing as my findings. And, and really, um, with the dyslexic side, dyslexia side of it, uh, it's staying like that. You know, like I feel like the findings did say what we're finding, and that, that's across the board. So I'm excited about that. And so, you know, I can go into that um, tonight with you if you'd like. Mm. Yeah, so. that would be great because um, as we've spoken about offline, uh, there really hasn't been any discussions that I'm aware of in Australia around um, intimate relationships and dyslexia. Uh, mm. So it's, it'll be fantastic to hear what you've found. Yeah, yeah, no, it is exciting. 
So, um, just, you know, back to what we were saying before, dyslexia is not a reading, writing, not just a reading, writing, spelling, maths, numbers, difficulty, or even, yeah, yeah. It, you could, I could expand on that. It affects so many different areas of functioning. And dyslexia basically means not language. So dyslexia means not language. So it's to do with the language difficulty or difference, which we're now saying more widely. And it's sort of like an easy way, I suppose, one way of describing it is it's the, an issue with the sequencing of letters and words and words and sentences. Um, but we know through uh, cognitive assessments now that it affects working memory and processing speed, which usually someone with dyslexia is quite low in those uh, proficiencies, we call them, and yet they have a very, very high other abilities. So um, it's important to know that. And so if we're looking at working memory, well, that's going to affect memory within the household. If we're looking at processing speed and it's lower than, than some others, that's going to affect communication. And ju just to sort of talk about couples for a minute, um, because, you know, I remember sitting in a <laughs> peer supervision group with this woman who, who was a very high couples practitioner high up over here. And she said, oh, all couples struggle with that, as I was describing my, my work with dyslexics. And I, and I said, yes, but, you know, so she's right. All couples have issues with communication, you know, um, emotional regulation, um, getting nowhere in an argument, um, having different temperaments, you know, issues there or histories that collide. I always say that um, intimate relationship is like a stage upon which we act out our childhood hurts. And that's it, it's a phenomenon, but it's actually true of every couple I've worked with. But you see, that's normal for all couples. But when there's dyslexia in the mix, it's much harder. And so, yes, dyslexic couples or, or couples living with dyslexia will have similar issues, but dealing with them is much harder because dyslexic individuals are much more vulnerable and their environment will maximise or minimise that vulnerability. And so we have to understand what is it about the dyslexia that's causing some things that make it much harder the comment that the counsellor said well that's all couples because that's what I tend to get feedback from well everyone just does that yeah it's you know why are you so different and so how do you raise that awareness in people whether it's in a couple or a family or friends or in a workplace where it's actually yes we do all have these similarities in how we behave but it's actually a lot harder like how do we increase that awareness not and especially for an intimate partner who may just say well you know that's just everyone so you're just whinging for no reason <laughs> yeah well, I mean, that's just like saying of children in the classroom oh well all children are like that so you have no reason to have anything harder or, or more focus on you because all kids can be like that and it's and it's like everybody the statement everybody's gifted I personally don't agree with that we can measure giftedness so um you know uh, no, it's not. So I, I tend to just get in and dialogue about it and say, well, actually, it's not. And here's the things that are sitting in behind it that make that much harder. Um, yeah, yeah. I think that's probably the easiest way to answer your question. And what um, I could, I won't sidetrack us with giftedness, uh, but so what are some of the, the key challenges? Uh, I know when we talked on our Facebook Live, you touched on communication. Yes. Um, last week. So what are the um, key challenges that people with dyslexia struggle with when they're in that in an intimate relationship? Yes, yeah, so in my research, and I like coming back to evidence-based research because it's, it's centred in the scientific, it's had its uh, peer, review, peer review, so I'll, I'll kind of talk about it as my research, which might be helpful um, <laughs> to listeners. But the first thing I found was that dyslexia impacted communication, and it, and it impacted it in the following ways. So, and, and this is specifically straight off the findings. Um, difficulty with accessing words. So this is the dyslexic partner's struggle. Accessing words. So this is around vocabulary and ex getting that word in the, in the brain and getting the right word, if you like, for what they're trying to say. Uh, it affected ordering words. So putting the, the words together to make sense. Uh, it affected speed of communicating, which the dyslexic person often takes longer. And the other person sort of moved on. It's like, 
husband wife say sitting on the couch and she's been busy going la, 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 you know because women have monologue a lot more words a day than men um and la, la 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 and she's talking away and he's intensely listening trying to keep up and then he sit and she asks him a question and he's sitting there sort of looking at her and all this period of time goes by and she's like well come on answer me and he's about to answer her but he's still getting the words together in his mind or it could be and this is not gender specific uh, you know, and she and she's frustrated. She's moved on. He's still trying to explain where he's his thinking's at, and that breaks communication. Information processing, information being discussed. So, like, let's say a couple's got they have friends over for dinner, and this is this is common, and I hear this is common. And sitting around the table, five or six friends, they're all talking about a topic. And the dyslexic person sitting at the table trying to keep up with the information coming in. It's new to them. And they don't say anything. They're just sort of quiet. And then the talk, the talking goes on into a different subject. And suddenly the person with dyslexia has gone, ah, and they've got their words to say. And they inter- interject and say their thoughts. But the other group's gone on. And then they're looking at them funny. And they feel so, that's where you have these shame triggers. And in the end, it's not uncommon for someone with dyslexia to just go quiet and shut down and not really uh, connect in. Have you noticed that they'll change the topic to something they know? Yep, they do because that's the randomly, thing. Randomly, randomly yeah. change the topic? Yeah, because that's the information that's in their head and that makes sense. And it's very hard to take in incoming information at the speed. I mean, we could get into neuroscience here, but at the speed that it's coming. So um, that actually is a real point with something I call talking act, which I'll come to in a minute. But one of the other things that it affects is clarity around um, arguments, like in, in remembering what what happened in the argument. So you tend to get circular arguments and uh, the dyslexia, the dysle- everybody can have that, but the dyslexic side of it is not remembering and going back round a topic, trying to recall, you know, and, and then the partner's bringing it back in and they're trying to recall and they can't recall. And it ends up arguing about the same thing and the same thing. So that came out in the research and all of this disrupts the flow of uh, communication. And partners often think their dyslexic partner isn't listening. <laughs> I actually think they're really working hard to listen. I observed that in the counselling room. It's just that they do, they're they taking uh, stuff in a lot more slowly. Uh, and I'm generalising here, every dyslexic's different. Um, another thing that happens within the communication is saying something that they didn't mean. And that's often to do with phonological processing. Like uh, one of my couples, um, I was staying there for the weekend and observing them, which was a real treat because they weren't in the city I live in. And, um, and they were in the kitchen and he said to, they were cooking and I was watching. And, and he said, could you please pass me that potato? And she says, oh, sure. And she hands him a potato. And he just lit right off in anger because he said, I said tomato. And she said, no, you didn't. You said potato. And he said, no, I did not. I said tomato. And he's really angry, which I'll talk about next. And, of course, tomato, potato, phonetically, phonologically, sorry, it's a similar thing. Mm, and you really and like, think you've said that word. Even yeah. if the other person swears black and blue, you didn't. But in your head, you're sure you said it. That's right. Yeah. No, and I'm sitting there and I mean, no, you didn't. You said potato. <laughs> and the, the angst from that, just massive argument, you know. Um, the other thing is perceptions, again, linked to that, believing you said something you didn't or, or believing you actually said something when you didn't actually say something. And these, are, these all affected my couples. And um, body language for a visual dyslexic can be difficult. Um, you know, that's, all, that's one of the main forms of communication is body language. And a visual dyslexic may not notice their partner is getting upset or getting angry or uh, struggling with something. I think one of the other things that the findings was it was difficult for the dyslexic participants to check things out with their partner because actually communicating and finding words was hard. Uh, and they often connected through their body. So through touch or sex or doing things for their partner um, because communicating with words is hard. And then finally, the talking act. Um, it was interesting. I went to a PhD student's art project with um, well, on dyslexia. It was fascinating, absolutely amazing. I was there for ages just looking at all the work that she had participants do. And uh, she said she was dyslexic. 
And I said, oh, I'm really keen to talk to you about my research. And she was just going, talking at me about everything that she had going on, but there just wasn't the pause for me to speak <laughs> to her. <laughs> and of course, that could be just anything. Um, but but I have seen that regularly and with my dyslexic friends, this tendency to share the information without necessarily taking it back in. So, you know, these were the findings from the communication side. Um, and if we're not communicating effectively, you know, we end up lonely. We end up isolated. And we're not wired for that. We're wired for connection. So communication is a major part of, um, of what happens with, dys- you know, from dyslexia in couples. Mm. And so um, did you want to talk about your other findings first? Or well, I'm interested yep. to know what are some of the strategies that yes. help in improving our communication? You know, the main thing for couples specifically is slow down. To slow down, for to give you, if you're dyslexic, give yourself more time and be okay to say, hey, I'm dyslexic, I need more time. You know, it, it's that part of disclosing it, isn't it? And uh, we could talk about shame at some point maybe, but to, um, you know, to, to give yourself more time and it's absolutely okay that you are dyslexic and you need time. And for partners, give your dyslexic partner more time. You know, so less words as well. That's a good Sorry. strategy for... Uh for just generally in life, isn't it? Absolutely. Mm. More time. Because really, I, like I have a dyslexic client in my seat, in my room, on the seat, and they'll be, I'll ask, because I do a lot of work with trying to name feelings, which we'll talk about next in a minute. Um, and, and they sort of, they, they go, I can't, I can't, I don't know. And I say, no, no, you do. Just slow it right down and take your time. And sure, sure, they get there. You know, they figure it out and they get there. The next one is externalising. I call it externalising. Dyslexic people often have high verbal skills. Not everybody, but many do. And um, it really helps to repeat back what you heard somebody say. So I'm hearing you say that you want me to put the rubbish out tonight. Yes, darling, she says or he says. Okay, I'm going to put the rubbish out tonight. And just hearing yourself say it back helps your brain take that in. I think uh, checking it out. So check out what you've heard the person say. So did you you hear me say potato? (laughs) You know, what did you hear me say? Um, And be brave enough to check it out. And not assume people understand. Ask if people understand. Do you understand what I've said? Um, I like Brené Brown's little um, strategy where she says, use the story I'm making up is. So the story I'm making up is that you're not talking to me right now because you're angry with me. Uh, I'm not angry with you. I'm just thinking or I'm being quiet. Ah, Okay. And it just takes the antagonism out of it. Uh, The other thing I think around externalizing is use your body. So if we ever get time, I'll tell you a little story about a shame story that I went through where I used my body to express myself. But it's about, you know, walk, walk around, act it out, be an actress or an actor to explain what you're thinking. And, and I think that's two strategies. Another one, uh, well, partially it's externalising, is use paper. And post-it notes are the best things. My clients love them. Some people have them all over their car, all over their walls, all over their bedroom door, <laughs> in the bathroom, on the mirror, <laughs> in the background. <laughs> you know, and it, it works. It works for remembering things and it works for, for, um, for what, even noting what you want to say uh, and writing it down, obviously, or draw it down, drawing it down. So I've created a method for communication to better communication called drawing talk, which I you know, won't go into now, but uh, it is about drawing on paper ex- to express uh, using pictures what the dyslexic person is trying to say. It helps them be understood and it slows their partner who's not dyslexic down so they don't rush ahead. Mm. So that's sort of some strategies for you. I'm going to practice some of those. <laughs> <laughs> Great. It's not all about me, everyone. It's not all about me. <laughs> no, that's right. How do we do, how do we work as a partner 
his partners, isn't it? Mm. <laughs> and so what were, um, there were four areas that your research found. Yeah, so the next area, and I was excited about this because not a lot of research linked dyslexia to executive functioning. It certainly did with ADHD. But my, my participants were all psychologically, uh, not psychologically tested, uh, cognitively assessed for having dyslexia in a diagnostic um, test and out, ruled out other things like ADHD. And um, I found that executive functioning was affected by dyslexia in relationships. And so uh, it can affect ordering, planning, sequencing, timekeeping, certainly housework. Some dyslexic people leave piles on the floor in the house and just move them around. They sort of know where their things are, but they pile them. Uh, or have a floor drobe, which partners often get the dyslexic sleeping away from the door so that the clothes are on that side of the bed that nobody can see on the floor. <laughs> Things like emptying the dishwasher and putting cups and plate plate drawers or, you know, pots and cup, cupboards and things like that was common. Um, even emptying the laundry, sorry, putting laundry in the laundry basket seemed to be difficult for some people. Definitely remembering to turn lights off and bathroom heaters off. My son the other night, again, how many times have I said, left the bathroom heater and the light on? And, you know, he, he just, he, and it's like putting uh, the right stuff in the recycling bin. You know, end up with McDonald's wrappers in the recycling bin, not the rubbish bin, things like that. It's just mm -hmm. so hard for him to remember. Um, things like remembering to pick the kids up from school on time or remembering birthdays and wedding anniversaries, um, you know, around dates. So that all came out in the, re in the research and strategies for that. There's so much really but just a few again things like post-it notes on the wall by the light switch or by rubbish bins reminding you of what you need to do um i think uh writing things on a whiteboard is fantastic mm. um and mind maps for ordering or planning at work or, in, or at university and reminders on your phone really help Mm -hmm. um, and I'll tell you a story about one of my clients who lets me speak about this. He, um, his wife w was really struggling with him not communicating and contacting her uh, just at least once during the day. She really needed that because there was a disconnect between them and um, he could never remember to do it. And so it was really affecting them, just that little simple thing. So what I came up with, I said, well, I've got an idea. Let's get one of those rubber kind of plastic wristbands that you can get cheaply at Kmart or whatever and wear that. And every time you look at it, I want you to ping it hard on, against your skin. And when you do that, I want you to text her. And he started doing this where he'd look at the band, ping it and text her. And, um, and that was resolving it. And it didn't take long for him to then remember to text her without the wristband. But it was just that visual reminder tactile reminder physical reminder and then he did it and I think for a while he was texting ping ping <laughs> ping to her because a lot of dyslexics don't like texting but uh, that really worked you know these little these little things so but here's the secret it needs to go into a rut you need to do it again and again and again and again and again till it's in a rut into long-term memory and really that's simple little strategies but you know there's more we could talk about or oh, one of the things if you're at work and you have your desk a certain way have your desk at home exactly the same way you have baskets at your desk at work have the same baskets at your desk at home so you don't get confused hmm. that's great I love that yeah so I that love was the floor drobe <laughs> I have a floor drobe the rest of the house is perfectly clean and tidy but I have a floor drobe in my bedroom <laughs> and I'm not ashamed to say it. <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> At least That's, you know where the stuff is. <laughs> I, I'm going to use that in um in a quote when we put your podcast out around four droves. <laughs> <laughs> so how are we doing? Is this is what I'm sharing it in at the right speed for your listeners? Do you think? I think so. And if they need further, if you need further information, our listeners, they can go on the website and get okay. further details as well. 
So yes, no, I think this is great. Thank you. I think the last finding is the most, one of the most important ones, and that is all my participants said, what, when I asked the question, what is the most difficult thing for you as a couple? I was flabbergasted. I thought they'd say communication because dyslexia being a language thing, and they didn't. They all said it was the emotional side. And I, I started really listening very, very closely then. Uh, not that I wasn't, but even closer to this. And, um, and I'm quite passionate about this because when we're talking about dyslexia being a thing for couples different to other couples, the emotional side is much harder. So here's the point is that emotions are not words, right? They're in the body. Um, so, and all of us can struggle with emotional vulnerability. Brene Brown's work is phenomenal on this. If anyone's uh, interested in, in getting some of her audio books or books, and many of us live in cultures that don't encourage emotional openness or talking about our feelings. I'm surprised at how many people say, "I wish I'd learnt this in school," you know, in the therapy room. But dyslexic people have the added difficulty of finding it hard to identify what they're feeling to name what they're feeling, to put the words to it, to calm their feelings and then express them. And that is my findings of that. It's due to language, working memory and processing speed, which is directly to do with dyslexia. Um, just to make a sweeping generalisation here, <laughs> I was talking with my co-author today about this, the higher the intelligence, the more grey matter, Right? The more grey matter, the more intensity in thinking and feeling. And that is measurable. Grey matter is measurable. So our dyslexics are most often, they wouldn't be called dyslexic unless they're moderately to highly to extremely highly intelligent. And so this can be a factor in dealing with the emotions where they just become, you know, in, in the sensory side, dyslexics are often very sensory. And, you know, we could go into neuroscience again around causal stuff and what my little thing, thinking is around that but I won't now so my, the findings and you'll send hopefully people the graphs the sorry the little cycles that I sent you about my findings but I found that there was a cycle and so what would happen is that it could be it could be communication so can't find the words or difficulty processing or it could be the executive functioning, difficulty sequencing, can't organise. Uh, or it could be the feelings, I don't know what I feel and I can't tell you what I feel. And when the dyslexic person came in touch with that struggle, and whichever one was happening for them, they would have this uh, emotional reaction. And it would be a self-esteem trigger, lots of the time shame, and they'd suddenly get triggered. And there would be a flood of emotion at the same time. And then that would knock out more, out, knock the words out. So they're struggling or knock the sequencing out even further. And they'd go blank. And everyone who's dyslexic listening to this, maybe not everybody, but a lot of people will, will understand what I'm saying and have experienced it. And of course, that just increases the emotional intensity because you've got a partner sitting there looking at you wanting an answer or, you know, wanting you to do that thing and they become overwhelmed. And that can be a trauma trigger right there, which another time we can talk about trauma. And then there was a coping, they would go into a sort of a, a not coping strategy of ex, either exploding, which is uh, a major issue, or withdrawing or getting defensive or suppressing their feelings and shutting down. And all of that affected relational connection in my research. So that, and you, you know, listeners can look at that cycle um, when you share that with them. But that was one of the main findings around the emotions. So before I go into another one, is that what you've experienced or what you hear? Yes, I don't want to turn this into a counselling session about myself. Because <laughs> <laughs> it's not about me. <laughs> But uh, I can relate very much to uh, a lot of you, what you're saying. Yeah. Um, yes, yeah, especially the not being able to get the words out and then just, for me, mm. it's just a complete shutdown yeah. and then a complete withdrawal and it can be for hours and it was such a bad trait my dad used to do when we were growing up where he wouldn't speak to people for days like anyone in our family. Um, and now I wonder if it was because of his dyslexia and he couldn't communicate what he 
and so he would withdraw and it's a really bad tendency that I have learnt and I don't know if I've learned it from him or whether it is my dyslexia but I will do the same thing. Mm. Yes and we do learn off our parents how to deal with emotions so it probably is a mixture of that and children don't emotionally regulate themselves they need parents to do that growing up until they can mm. but you're right and, and you know it's and see, see my point there that I was making earlier about, yes, all couples, you know, we can all struggle emotionally, but can you see how the dyslexia is the, the key tr- the triggers off that mm. cycle? And, and you see, if we're, if we're talking, if we're, say, in counselling or we're in an in, in a, a intimate relationship, you know, it is the dyslexia. It's sitting underneath it. Because if you didn't struggle to find the words, it wouldn't be the trigger. So it's so important to understand this in the dyslexia world. And I Mm. think that's helpful for all of our listeners who are dyslexic to go, hang on, well, for me, what I'm going to try and practice now is, hang on, this is my dyslexia reacting. I need to take a minute and try to put the non-dyslexic side (laughs) into the equation. But I think it makes me feel like it, it makes me feel a bit better knowing that this is my dyslexia reacting. And so then learning how to then manage that reaction. Yes, maybe we, that could be our next podcast. How do you manage that reaction so that you don't blow up or you don't withdraw and internalize it all, or storm out the house for the whole day? Yeah, yeah, and I'll, I'll touch on that briefly at the end because I think that would be helpful. I think uh, there's some, something else I want to share around the emotions too, because some listeners will be going, "Well, I, I don't feel like that." Um, not around the self-esteem. I've got a good self-esteem. And, and I got thinking about this and did an ad, I think it's called an adjunct study off to the side where I sent um, uh, uh, like some questionnaires around the country asking for feedback concerning um, the intensity of emotions. And I got a good response um, whether the dyslexic people actually felt anger or sadness as intensely as excitement and joy. And I asked a lot of other questions as well. And, gen, you know, and did they have a low self-esteem? Did they think that? And then their partners also added that in just to check that they were, they were in t- touch with what they were really meaning. Uh, and it came back saying that they did generally feel the same level of intensity. And so that made me realise that it's not just self-esteem in the cycle that affects some of this response because some people were saying they had a massive emotional response um, and shut down under pressure, um, like my cycle says, but they had a good self-esteem. So then I produced the other cycle, which I've sent to you that you can pass on. And that is, uh, that is, um, starts with the person getting in touch with the difficulty like the other cycle, you know, where they're actually um, can't name something or can't get the word or can't sequence or, something like that, and actually they just go under pressure and overload from trying to get the word out, and it's not necessarily a self-esteem thing. They're overloaded, and the overloading brings an overwhelm, and the overwhelm is a flood of emotion, and then we have the same thing. Going blank, can't process, that increases emotional intensity, going into a not coping strategy of exploding, withdrawing, defensive or suppressing of feelings, and then that affects relational connection. And I think those two emotional findings are really important and, to, and, and distinct. Yeah. Well, it makes me feel a bit better and it helps explain my dad. I think after reading your one of your research papers, it helped explain a bit more about my dad growing up, but having this conversation helps me understand, you know, those long day drawn out days of withdrawal why that why that might have been and it was always a trait I really didn't want to um take into relationships as an adult Mm. but it's um yeah and maybe partly it is because of my dyslexia and I don't know how to respond and I've always very open with my listeners in that I've had um therapy for a very long time um since early adulthood really but speaking to you, I think, hmm, there's still a lot of work to be done. <laughs> oh, I, sounds like you, you've done really well, actually. You know, that's brave to be in therapy a while and to do that work. You know, there's a lot of people really scared of therapy. And actually, 
we don't bite. We really love people and just want to help. And it can be just such a good area of learning to open up and share what you're feeling. Just in terms of suppression or withdrawal, I was amazed all my dyslexic participants and my research told me um, that they all got in their cars and drove away when they were upset. <laughs> and, and every single one of them. And I'm sitting there with my mouth open like, what? Um, and, and that was the strategy. And off they went. And, you know, <laughs> brilliant. It's pretty. Our um, listeners can't see me right now because I'm huddled <laughs> over my desk, hand over mouth laughing because that was a very, very recent event for me. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. So I'm 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 100 with your participants. All you need to do is hop in the car and drive away. Yeah, and look, I say I say go you, you know. But if you're in a trauma trigger, you don't want to be doing that if you're about to have a panic attack. So that that's a problem. Get in the car by all means. Maybe don't drive off. But you know the partners didn't understand it. So or some did. But, you know, actually, let them go. And this is back, you know, when I talk about simple strategies in a minute, just briefly, um, that's one of them, you know, to understand the need to exit. You know, but really, it's important to you know, go away in your car by all means, but come back and talk about it with your partner. <laughs> uh, yeah, that's the next bit to practice more of. Yeah. But I think I liked the other day when you talked in our um, Facebook Live around having that seat or a yes. space where you can go to and just kind of decompress. Yes. Um, and I'm, I aim to purchase a space, a seat or something that I can say this is my, <laughs> yeah. so that I don't hop in the car. <laughs> mm. But somewhere, but that's, that's hilarious. I'm not the only dyslexic person driving <laughs> around. No. <laughs> no, not at all. In fury. <laughs> Oh, it's great. You know, what a clever strategy. Go you lot. I think that's fantastic. I really, um, I think it's it's so important to note that exiting and, and part of me wants to get in and just teach you all about something called the pain paradox right now about how to handle pain. But I don't, I don't think we necessarily have time for that. But we could come back to that at some other time when we talk about trauma. But I, I, I think with feelings, it's important to, to, to learn, I call it going surfing. And it's to learn to get in touch with what you're feeling, let yourself feel it, and eventually name it. So I have sent you a little handout on called Building Emotional Health, which I suddenly put together, just came into my mind early this morning, called Ackle. Because <laughs> I was trying to think about how can we help people sort of learn this and remember it. And again, it's a word I know, but... You know, I can't remember what they call them when you use the first letter of a of, of a, a word for the for this point. Sorry, I should know this. Can't think of it right now at this time. No, I can't remember either. <laughs> <laughs> but um, but it's a picture. And I've got I've got Apple, and and it's about following the process to handle these feelings. So the first thing is to be aware that you're actually feeling something that you've triggered, or you're feeling something. And the only way you're going to know is listening to your body. So building an awareness in your body, I spend a lot of time with my clients listening to, okay, where are you feeling that right now? It, okay, it's in the pit of my stomach and, and it's traveling up and it's in my chest. And we often can then put anxiety to it or anger to it. Um, and I'll share a wee story about how I worked with this with, with one of my clients who lets me talk about him when I finish this list. But that, So A is for awareness. P, pause and then calm. You know, we forget to hit the pause button and just stop and then use calming strategies, which I've sent you a list of, of ones that I use to calm yourself down. That's like pause by getting in the car, you know, <laughs> and calming down. Uh, it takes about 20 to 30 minutes for a feeling to shift. So you need to be in the shitty chair, I think I called it, or in the car for 20 to 30 minutes. For trauma triggers, it can be up to an hour. Okay, and we need to decipher those, to separate those two or at least know that they're a bit different. The next P in Apple is put words to feelings. To name what you're feeling and that's the hard part. So I've sent you the feelings wheel. I went and tried to find the author of it and there's all these different people saying it's all these different authors. So I gave up and I can't reference it. However, it's a very helpful tool around trying to figure out what feeling it is and put it to the feeling in your body. L is to link it then. Once you're calmed down, where is this coming from? Oh, it's my inner child who's really enraged because my partner didn't validate 
what I needed and I'm peed off and I'm off and I'm angry and it's my inner child who that that happened because my mother did it to me you know and then working it through and then E is for express it's important to learn to say what you're feeling and why and ask for support because if you don't express what you're feeling people can't support you and they, you can't be objective about your feelings if you don't name them and express them. So that's apple, very simply. And on there, I've got an apple a day keeps explosions away. <laughs> so if you can, I love yeah. that. <laughs> I'd love to circulate some of your images through our um, community, if that's all right. Yeah, sure. <laughs> So Apple is a strategy, obviously exiting, we've talked about grounding strategies, which I've sent you. Breathing is on there, the importance of breathing and mindfulness, you know, to be, that's the latest thing around calming our emotions. And, um, you know, if people haven't already, go and do a mindfulness course, but breathing and paying attention to the body and the breath and the feelings. Physical grounding is great. Um, in the middle of lockdown, I actually found lockdown, I still have, still find it quite hard. We've just come out of lockdown again in Auckland here. Um, in the first lockdown, my son and I were up in the night just trying to calm ourselves down a bit because I don't like feeling trapped because of my past trauma. And um, we were walking around with our feet in the grass, just letting our physical uh, energy out into the ground. And um, same as putting your feet in the sea. It just, you know, walking around in these rubber shoes that we wear, not helpful for, for getting those electrons out. Um, decompression, a quiet place. One of my clients calls it cocooning, uh, gets into bed under the covers, which is great. Just don't stay there longer than 20, 30 minutes. Okay. And, of course, what I said about going surfing. So we could talk more about that. But here's a little story about my client who was explaining, uh, we were working to try and isolate how he was feeling in his body because he was actually violent to the, his wife and children and he would just explode and throw things. He's a gifted dyslexic man. And he, um, and women, by the way, this is not gender specific, women do this too. So if I'm leaning towards more men, sometimes that's because a lot more men are identified with dyslexia. But um, anyway, he, we worked with him and his body and he described it like this pressure coming out down into his head and into his brain and no one can see me doing this so, I, so I'll try and use words to describe it and it would go tighter and tighter and tighter and tighter into his brain and he was describing it with his hands as it went down into the size of a tennis ball and his fists clenched like this and he was feeling real rage. And it would go down, and this is all went back to his childhood at school and his parents. And it would go into this tennis ball sized fist in his head, and this is how he was feeling. And then it would just suddenly just go boom and explode. And he could picture all the bits just bursting out of this ball and explosion. And so, what we did was we started to identify when it was starting. And when it started in his head, that's when he would exit before it got to the tennis ball size and then exploded today that person very rarely explodes it to his family wow. and he exits and calms himself down really well now he can put words to his feelings enough that he can sit with his wife and children because they're dyslexic some of them and say what he's feeling and they can talk it through well with each other and he was really violent at times so you know listening to the body and getting the words to it and, it, and calming it, like the apple that I've explained. Mm. And you gave that family a whole new lease on life. Yeah, I'm really proud wow. of them. You know, that's amazing because you don't always hear positive outcomes. So, you know, it's such important work that you're doing and I really hope that we can have you um, on a couple of shows to talk about trauma and shame. I think um, yeah. there's such important topics that haven't been raised in Australia and um, we haven't had the opportunity to talk about uh, these these type of challenges before. So I really am so appreciative and it makes me think how much more therapy I probably need and possibly that I should fix my floor drobe. <laughs> <laughs> you might need some help with that. That's okay. <laughs> Someone to just help guide you with it. <laughs> well, the rest of it, we, you know, you make sure everything's perfect outside the bedroom, but the bedroom... And since I've, been a, since I've been a teenager, it's always been the same. Yeah, my friend who's dyslexic says that. She says, I'm not letting you come and see my room. 
Because <laughs> that's okay, darling. But, you know, we can all be a bit messy anyway. But, that, you know, but I think that's my point in this talk. And, and I, hope, I hope listeners can see and, and you can see what the point I'm making around couples is that dyslexia has a distinct difference. It's got, there are reasons why dyslexics and, and couples struggle. And it isn't just normal couple stuff. Yes, it can lead to normal couple stuff, but there's other things going on and we need to understand that to help them. Yeah. Well, I think this has been a fantastic uh, introduction to this topic and I really look forward to us being able to um, do some further work around this. So thank you so much for coming on the show. I really, really appreciate your time today, Jane, and for your time last week as well in helping us uh, start to grow our mental health and thriving series. So thank you so much again. Thanks for having me, Shay. It's just such a delight to come in and talk. Thank you. Thank you. Stay well in New Zealand and we look forward to speaking to you soon. Thanks. You too. Stay well in Melbourne. Thinking of you. To find out more about Jane and all her wonderful work, head to deardyslexic.com. You can also find additional resources on dyslexia and relationships and dyslexia and mental health through our Mental Health and Thriving series and on our resource page. If you haven't done so already, make sure you've signed up to our mailing list so you can keep up to date with everything we're doing at the foundation. Sign up at deardyslexic.com. And don't forget, if there is anything at all you've heard today that was distressing, you can contact the Dear Dyslexic Foundation's helpline on 1800 589 667 or Beyond Blue on 1300 4636. And there's also Lifeline that you can contact on 13 11 14. Thanks for listening and bye for now.